Yes, testing, testing, ready to rumble. Thank you very much for attending this talk on, uh, on killing DevOps. There will be lots of blood, so watch out if you're sitting, uh, sitting at the front. I hope that you like my new motto. I have to think about things in depth before I can talk about them with uncertainty. You know the way it goes. The more you learn about stuff, the more you realize you don't know enough. So if you catch me talking about something with apparent certainty, I probably don't know what I'm talking about. You'll notice I have a strange job title, the, the IT paradigmologist. And if you just think about the word paradigmologist, that's somebody who studies paradigms. And I, I really enjoy studying the differing ways that people look at IT, and I think DevOps is an excellent paradigm to study. So it's a great, um, great thing for me to, uh, to explore, and I'm going to be doing that with you. Another great quote I'm keen on is, um, is Dijkstra, who goes back ages. He was really the godfather of structured programming. I'm, I'm sure many of, you, you, many of you will have come across him in your, in your education. And it's such a great quote, this. Computing's core challenge is how not to make a mess of it. I think it still, uh, it still rings true. Two critical questions I think you should be asking yourselves, or possibly asking the speakers during this conference. Challenge the speakers. Really? What's the evidence? Where's that come from? It's the one question, and the other question is, so what? What's the value? that I'm going to get out of this. So uh, please think about particularly the, the value part. How could DevOps help you um, improve the way you work and improve, uh, get, get more, help your, your users to get more business value out of their investment? Now, from time to time, you'll see bottom right, you'll see a little no photo sign emerge. That does not mean that you can't take photos. You can take photos of any of the slides, but as long as you see the, the sign, I'm still building up the slide. So if you want to take a photo of the full slide, just wait until the end. Then it prevent that this is my little service to the, um, to the audience community. You know, I see people taking, when's he finished with his build? Anyway, that's, uh, that's my little contribution to, uh, to conferences. I bring the regards of the DevOps Days community in Shanghai, where you see them very enthusiastic, particularly on the on the left. This was before the talk, by the way. I I didn't bother with the after photo. There's a guy here at the front taking a picture of me. You know, as I said, people take pictures at conferences quite a lot, and this is the picture that he took of me taking a picture of them. And so I thought at the next conference, uh, this was in uh, Vienna. Um, guy taking a picture there of me with the picture of Shanghai in the background. At the next conference in Dublin, there's me ta again taking with my modest little camera here, taking a picture of the, a picture of the audience with the picture of Vienna and Shanghai. Uh, this was Riga, DevOps Days Riga. You sort of get the, get the idea. Last week in the Netherlands, this guy was kind enough to take a picture of me. I thought, now, wouldn't it be cool <laughs> if we don't break the chain? And if I take a picture of you, could you put up the light so I get a nice um, bit of decent exposure on my, uh, on my crappy little camera? Yeah, I think that's all. Oh, hang on, just got to get out of the... Uh, that's it. You good there? Right. One, two, three. Great, thank you very much, thank you. And hopefully, have you got a good shot? Bit dark, okay. Do, uh, let's try this. Right, is that better? Good, excellent. Thank you, sir. So at my next talk, you'll be in the audience and um, we'll continue the chain. I always feel like a bit of an imposter when I talk about DevOps because I don't do this stuff anymore. I just talk about it. But I hope, because I'm, I'm a, a, a traveling ambassador representing a not-for-profit organization that has collected best practices 
in the area of application management and what we call in the middle here business information management, which is the kind of stuff that business people do when they engage with IT. These practices that we've collected and uh, it's, it's my role as their ambassador to share this knowledge with other communities. So it sort of gets me around. So I think I have a, a, a varied number of perspectives. And hopefully I can share perspectives on something that might be familiar to you, but from a slightly different angle. So here you see a couple of birds. But if you look at them from a different angle, you see something different. So hopefully I'll give you a, a slightly different perspective on, um, on DevOps. I'm looking at the IT industry. It is now my 40th year in IT. Um, looking at it from a 40-year perspective, and if you if you want to know how how do you become an IT paradigmologist, you start off as a programmer at 100% happiness. The happiness axis is is essential. Then you get seduced into taking on management responsibilities. Mark, you're such a good programmer, why don't we promote you to something that you're completely incompetent for? And, th and this, is, this has got an official name. This is a recognized principle called the Peter Principle. People get promoted to their level of incompetence. That's you know just the way things work. So that this, this here, in, in around the 2000s, most difficult choice in my career was to drop this status of, of management roles and focus on the content. I'm, I'm a content guy. And for, for marketing purposes, I, I reinvented myself as the IT paradigmologist. Now, it does give me the privilege of looking back on, on four decades of IT and thinking about the 80s when um, we were still building a lot of systems then. And we needed to master the, uh, the development activities, a lot of emphasis on project management. Then in the 90s, we looked around and we said, gosh, we've built an awful lot of systems. We need to get these under control. We need to start managing them. So the discipline of IT service management emerged. In the 2000s, we realized that things needed to speed up. That's when, uh, in 2001, Agile was born. And in, the, in this decade, I'd say it's going to be a toss-up between DevOps and digital transformation, which seems another very dominant dominant topic, so it'll be, in, be interesting to see how that, uh, how that pans out. But looking back, you know, project management ended up in dictatorship, IT service management in bureaucracy, agile, certainly some agile people in fundamentalism arguing about sticky notes, so it'll be interesting to see where DevOps um, DevOp ends up. So let you know, come, come back in 10 years' time and we'll see where where it ends up. Th these things always end in tears, is my experience. These, um, with any religion or movement, you can hear the, it started off with a great idea, but no, not the way we intended it. People take it off in a different direction. So let's, let's see where DevOps ends up. The summary of the talk is DevOps is useless. Unless seen in a bigger picture, in co-creational collaboration with the business. And co-creational collaboration is really a key, a key concept here. Service provider and service consumer co-creating value. And but this, this stuff, if you haven't come across it before, as a health warning here, it really messes with your head. And this has been, I've stolen this from, from my good friend, the IT skeptic, Rob England, to um, uh, uh, interviews in um, a podcast format, about 45 minutes each, if you want to hear the whole story. But this is just, just a flavor of the kind of things you'll find in the DevOps environment. That DevOps is undefined. There is no central authority that can tell you what DevOps is. It's very much an emergent practice. And if you're used to looking, at, looking at, at frameworks and bodies of knowledge and finding one single source of truth, that really messes with your head. Another concept which really scares some people is that code, once committed, goes automatically in production. This is the more extreme form of DevOps. And it's scary, as is the concept of testing in production. 
but it's really just realizing that you can't, because things are so um, non-deterministic, you can't predict how things are going to turn out in production. So e even though, of course, you test as much as you can, you've still got to be prepared to, to fail forward and to test in production. This is a crazy one as well. If it hurts, do it more. This is touching on the concept of anti-fragility that you might have come across. If something's fragile, if you drop it, it'll break. If something is resilient, if you drop it, it'll remain the same. It won't change. But if something is anti-fragile, if you drop it, it gets stronger. It's like, um, like bodybuilding. You, know, if you, you feel the pain, but the more you do it, the stronger you get. And it's, it, this is the idea of building resilient, um, anti-fragile organizations that get get stronger every time. So don't avoid pain. Uh, do it more, then the pain will, um, will decrease. Favorite one of mine, uh, treat servers like cattle, not pets. Lots of people, at least used, used to treat, you know, you give servers names. And you take care of them. You give them milk and food and stuff. Increasingly, they're being treated as numbers. And you just, if you don't need a server anymore, you destroy it. Then you generate a new one. Very much, much emphasis on, uh, on infrastructure as code, using scripts to generate servers, networks, various inf infrastructural components. And the final one, talking about code, be mean to your code. Uh, release a chaos monkey on your code to destroy as much of your, as much of your system as possible, because it just, it, it discovers weaknesses. And that's, um, that's an, another scary concept. Who on earth would want to destroy the system that they're trying to protect? You do it because you want to improve. If it hurts, do it more. And then finally, one of the, um, one of the strong overarching elements in, in DevOps is a very strong culture, often called a generative culture. You'll, you'll come across that term quite a lot in, uh, in DevOps. My uh, my friend Charlie Betts did a great talk in 2014 at the uh, at a, a conference in in Las Vegas. Talked about the apparent um, a tension between change and stability. You have the impression the more you change things, the less stable the system will become. Then the other way around, the more you protect a system, the more difficult difficult it will be to change. But if you if you explode that concept of change, and look at three components, look at the change frequency, the change size, and your capability to do change, you realize that the more often you change things, it, probably the change is going to be smaller, because instead of doing a big change, you split it up into three parts, maybe, you have smaller changes. The smaller the changes, the less likelihood there is that the system will be affected as far as stability is concerned. So small changes are good. The other way around, the more you do stuff, the more practice you get, the more mastery you get, the better you become at, at change, your f bet better change capability, the better you are at change, the less likelihood, less risk there'll be that stability will be affected. So you, you see that's it's really it's changing that mental model that we're so comfortable with, change and stability as opposites, and realizing the more frequently you do it, the better. But again, that sort of messes with your head. The, um, the agenda of the talk, the first, first two topics are going to take longer than the, than the second two, to explore DevOps to discover what it is. Um, then thinking about the concept of value and how you sell an investment in DevOps to business executives who aren't interested in IT. Thinking about where your weakest link is, because you should really be focusing on your weakest link. And, and finally, and that's where the kill DevOps uh, comes back to the story, adopting the right attitude. Let's, uh, let's explore de uh, de DevOps. Lots of enthusiasm about DevOps, really great stuff, but what are we actually talking about? There's a lot of confusion out there. It's really uh, on, the, on the top of the hype cycle at the moment. So the term is, is ab often abused. You may have heard the story about the six blind men and the elephant. All come across an elephant. One grabs the leg and says, I found a tree. The other one finds the tail and says it's, it's a piece of rope. 
So six different perspectives on one thing. In IT, however, it's the other way around. Every, any, anything you seem to come across in IT, it seems to be DevOps. Very much, uh, very much on the top of the hype cycle. If you, however, you put six businessmen in a room with IT, the only thing they see is return on investment. And that's a, you know, that's a, that's a very, very valid statement. Because they don't really care what we do, they just want the return on their investment. So I'd like to combine those two, uh, those two perspectives. Looking at this very simple illustration that's taken me about 40 years to come up with, uh, incredible, uh, incredible how I can be so stupid, you come to conferences like these to get guidance so that you can improve the way you work, so you make better, faster, cheaper information systems and services. That's pr presumably why you're here systems and services that the business uses to achieve their business goals better. They treat IT as, a, as an investment, and they want a return on their investment. Look at the IT function very simplistically, and you can say it comprises a dev, op, a dev component and, a, and an ops component. Look at the business. It's about demand or requirements. What do we need? And it's about use, when they finally get the systems and services they asked for, realizing the value out of it, which hopefully, hopefully corresponds with the value they wanted in the first place. Very simplistic way of looking at things. Let's dive in, in, into it in, uh, in four dimensions here, four swim lanes in a sort of a very simplistic value stream. Starting off in the business, who want to make an investment. In order to do that, they have to specify their requirements so that development can build applications. Applications, development needs infrastructure, needs tooling, needs stuff to do their work, as does operations. They also need tooling, things like a deployment pipeline, for instance, to get stuff from development to operations. You, you notice I've positioned operations both in applications and in infrastructure. I think you've got to keep those two, those two major components up and running. Where would we position Agile in this value stream? I so do you think you could argue where in the business it starts, but it certainly, if you, f if you follow the, uh, the, the Scrum definition of Agile, uh, it ends with potentially shippable increments, that little block down, down on, the, um, on the bottom right of the Agile, of the Scrum diagram there, which are shipped into production. Uh, Agile stops with potentially shippable, not shipped yet, so you need, you need something to, to deploy it in, into production. And by the way, because those increments are really output, I like to call them excrements. So it's potentially shippable product excrements that go into production. This is the area that people usually call IT service management. Now, up until now, we spend an awful lot of money and energy building stuff, but we've got no value at all out of it until the users use the systems not only use the systems, but use and interpret the information out of the systems to take the right decisions and achieve business value, which hopefully corresponds with what the, um, what the business wanted in the first place. So now we've, got, we've sort of closed the circle there. The, um, the question is, where is DevOps in this, in this value stream? Is it this little area here connecting development and operations and infrastructure? Or is it much broader? And the answer is yes, it's both. Because you can see these from, uh, from, a, from a dual perspective. And I'd, I'd like to illustrate that, because there's, there's a lot of confusion about that often, what people actually mean when they, uh, when they say DevOps. I'm leaning very heavily on the excellent DevOps handbook, which is the prescriptive companion to the Phoenix Project, who, if you've heard of DevOps, you've probably read that uh, bo excellent book both of them. The DevOps handbook talks about principles and technical practices which you can apply, the kind of guidance that you can apply. Both principles and technical practices intended to increase the flow of work uh, from, uh, from development through testing, integration into deployment, while at the same time maintaining world-class reliability, security, availability, the operational characteristics, the resilience of the information system. So balancing speed of change with um, operational behavior. The book costs about $20. Uh, 
um, but you can get a free excerpt of the first 130 or 140 pages. You find that pretty easily if you Google free excerpt. Well worth a look. Oh, sorry, he's still in there. These are the um, these are the guys, three of the three of the four authors uh, behind the the DevOps handbook. Um, very well, if you're familiar with the with the area, very very familiar names there. Uh, if um, if you're looking for a single source, an, an authoritative source of guidance, if these guys don't know it, nobody knows it. The guy in the middle, by the way, Patrick Dubois, Belgian guy, he was, the, he, was the, he was the guy who came up with the term DevOps, combining development and operations. And if you're wondering whether Patrick in the middle is particularly tall or, or John on the left is, is small, then here's the answer to the question. This is where I met John for the first time in, the, in the Amsterdam a couple of years ago. So he says, Patrick is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty tall. And this is, I've photoshopped Jez, Jez Humble in, just to give you the faces behind this, this excellent guidance. John Willis, the guy on the left there, he summarizes the book as it being about continuous delivery and about culture. Everything in version control, small batches, frequent deployments, um, consolidate everything back to trunk, very strong lean principles here, manage the work in progress. And on the cultural side, uh, lots of autonomy, responsibility as low as possible in the organization to knowledge workers who understand what they do. A good definition of done. John says done, definition, when, it, when is your software done, when it's released? I'd say, I take it a step further when the user's actually getting value out of it then you can be satisfied that you've, you've done your job well. Things like, th things like these, removing silos from the, of course, difficult challenge in large organizations, but that's the, uh, that's the DevOps uh, challenge. The CLAMS or CALMS abbreviation you'll come across quite often. The emphasis on, in DevOps on culture, automation, lean, much emphasis on lean, measurement, scientific method, and sharing knowledge. But to, uh, to John Willis's frustration, he was one of the people who came up with the, um, the CALMS definition, Ori originally CAMS, uh, which you'll see here in this tweet. I'm officially pulling the, pulling the C out of CAMS. Nobody really gives a shit about it anyway. It's always about the tools. Lots of people in the DevOps community focus very much on automation, but culture is the key to change. And there's, um, that's why it's good that there's, in the DevOps handbook, lots of emphasis on the, on the right culture, the cultural norms that you should adopt. High trust, no blame. Make it acceptable for people to pull the Andon cord that they have in Toyota to stop the production line, say, guys, something's gone wrong, swarm around the problem, solve it, and then fix it. Just think about that in your organization. If you stop pr the production line, would you be blamed or not? DevOps culture is no blame. The, a generative culture. Generative, you'll see the note down the bottom, generative as opposed to a pathological or a bureaucratic culture. And have, have a look at that research by, uh, by Ron Westrom if you're interested in, uh, in more. The, there's a, a lot of emphasis on, on people in DevOps, Gene Kim, uh, one of the authors you saw on the um, on the right uh, talks about a humane about humane IT, trying to make IT a normal place to work, a happy place to work, and being aware of of the the risk of burnout with these symptoms, exhaustion, cynicism, ineffectiveness in your activities, uh, realizing that they can come from various sources, just being conscious of what's going on at, at work and. and doing your best to, uh, to make, uh, make IT a good place to work. Back to, the, back to the handbook, there are 67 technical practices, very much on everything that starts with continuous. Integration, testing, de development, uh, continuous de uh, delivery, continuous deployment. 40 of these practices focus on development, 21 on applications, 
on, on sorry on operations and 22 on infrastructure and it's you, you, you see these don't add up to um, to 67 because there's overlap between the, the the technical practices but this is my best mapping of the of the practices on these areas very important to realize that many people in the in the devops space are building tooling for dev and ops to do their work they're not actually doing dev and ops they're building the tooling it's good to realize these technical practices are a fa fairly focused narrow um, application of the guidance on the continuous stuff. If you look at the principles, however, we can add the business to this, uh, to this area because you can really use these principles in a much broader way. Based on the, um, on the three ways of DevOps, you might have come across this before, first way is the fast flow of work from left to right, getting stuff from development to operations. The second way is getting fast, frequent, and good feedback, but also feed forward information exchange so you can, you can adapt your way of working quickly, uh, correct, uh, correct defects, a quick, uh, quick information exchange. And the final one, indeed, that little, uh, the continue, the, those little iterations in the middle, continuous learning and experimentation, daring to experiment, take safe to fail experiments, and um, every time you do it better and better and better. So this is really the dual nature of DevOps, which, which might deconfuse you when you hear the term. Sometimes it's applied for this very focused area, improving the collaboration between Dev and Ops. But sometimes it's a applied in a much broader way. And I'm, I'm a very keen, uh, keen advocate of applying the principles to include the business in this whole equation, because that's where the, that's where the, the the investment starts and where the, uh, the, um, the benefit gets realized at the end. So summarizing this first, uh, this first part, beware of the hype, realize that DevOps can be used in, in different ways, a broader way and a narrow way. The DevOps handbook contains principles and practices which are really, um, really authoritative guidance. Now how do you go around selling this stuff to business executives who aren't really interested in IT? Now, this is you. You're the engineer with the CEO, and you're really keen on, on selling DevOps because it's, uh, you know, this is serious shit. So you're tr trying to explain to the, the CEO that you want to make an investment, but he says, now, why should we be investing in DevOps instead of in other things, like acquiring other companies um, or uh, Im Im improve improving um, Im improving our marketing department. I've got other things on my mind. Why is this DevOps so important? So you come up with a ridiculous terminology like continuous containers, immutable microservices, and calms as code, which is nonsense. So he says that you know, come back when you speak my MBA language. This is just techno babble. You've got to learn to speak the. Uh, speak the language. Now, fortunately, there, has, there is some excellent research on DevOps, the annual State of DevOps report on the left here. And uh, from time to time, you see, um, see one-off reports, the one on the, one on the right here, uh, measuring return on investment from DevOps. What it, what it basically boils down to is faster delivery of more resilient and cheaper IT. But I'd put a question mark behind cheaper because I'd, I'd, it, it, it depends very much on the kind of industry you, it, you're in, how much you spend on IT and well, whether that's relevant. Certainly results in a happier workforce and happier, happier people are, are known to correlate with successful enterprise performance. So you've got a good, good business case there. Let's just do a little, little bit of thought, a bit, bit of analysis on the, on the nature of information systems and IT services, looking at four dimensions, utility, warranty, delivery, and costs. And with utility, I mean the fitness for purpose, the functionality of the system, what does it actually do for the business? Then we have the fitness for use, the, the warranty, uh, the operational characteristics, and these go hand in hand. It's no good having a system that has great functionality if the, if the availability is lousy. So obviously they, they complement each other. Speed, not only speed, but also priority 
of, um, of the work you do. If you've got three pieces of work to do, which piece should you be doing first? Which is going to ge generate the most, the most value? Do you have a mechanism to determine which piece of work you should be doing first? If you're in the agile space, you might have come across the name Don Reinertsen. Really, lots of people see him as the, look at almost any agile book. In, in the references at the back, you'll find Don Reinertsen. He, he's got the, the concept of the cost of delay, which is a way of calculating which work you should do first. Then finally, the last I mentioned, the fourth one, is the cost of de development and operations. And I put these here in a, in a little chart so you can see, see how, how fitness for use uh, relates to fitness for purpose. Speed and priority relate to both. And of course, the quicker you do things, the quicker you get the costs as well. But the question is, how do these relate to business goals? I'm taking the example of a for-profit organization that wants more sales, higher prices, lower costs and risks. And you can see if we, if we start at the bottom here, we can reduce the cost of development and operations, and that will reduce, and I'm, I'm deliberately using business language, lower OPEX and CAPEX, operational expenditure and capital expenditure. But the thing is, if you're working for a company which, uh, take, um, I asked the question at a, at a conference in May, and a guy from Air Canada uh, said, um, I, I asked how much do you spend on, on IT as a percentage of your total business costs? He said, we spend 1.5% on IT. We spend 40% on fuel, just to put things in the right proportion. So you can imagine if you're responsible for IT and you, you come up with a great idea to improve your, reduce your cost by 10%. There's only 10% of 1.5%, so it, it, it does very much depend. On average, I'd say 10 to 15% of total business costs are IT costs. You certainly, you know, if you, if you can, do it. Translating the speed of improvement in the speed of delivery of IT services, that will relate in quicker time to market of external products and services, but also quicker business change if your business change is related to IT. Fitness for use. Um, translates into fewer costly business disruptions, which will save you money. And if the customer notices that your system has gone down, then if you can improve that, you'll give, give a better customer experience and more loyal customers are known to, to uh, prepared to pay more for your products and services, and they often buy more from you, so that's more sales and higher prices. Then finally, of course, it depends very much on the functionality of the information system you're building. You can use it in the traditional way to automate the business and reduce costs and risks, but increasingly people are using IT to, to change their business model uh, with extreme examples like Airbnb and Uber who have really changed their market around by using functionality to, um, to focus, on the, uh, focus on the top line, not the, not the bottom line. So with that, um, with that little MBA course in IT, you know, you can come back to the CEO and, and say, you know, when he asks you why should we invest in DevOps, you use terminology like quicker time to market, fewer costly business disruptions. This is terminology that, that these, these guys understand. So that's the, uh, that, that's the challenge, to tr translate your great efforts into this simple, simple um, these sort of one-liners. So now you're speaking the same language. Summing this second part off before we do the last two uh, parts very quickly, focus on the speed of delivery, the fitness for use, and the fitness for purpose. I think they're the main benefits from, uh, from DevOps, lesser so uh, uh, the cost aspects. Don't mention DevOps or IT when you're talking to business executives. Focus on benefits, costs, and risks. Final two parts to be aware of is um, where's your weakest link? Is it in the in the prequel to IT in the business? Do they have difficulty formulating the requirements or, or or identifying the kind of investments that they should be making? Is your weakest link in the IT department itself, in the IT function, or is it at the end of the chain? Think about your the organizations that you're familiar with, the user organizations. 
how effectively do you think your users use the systems and therefore derive value from the investments? That is often the weakest link. A weak link, and of course, the weakest link should be your highest priority. So you, you know, you could be focusing on IT, whereas the weakest link is elsewhere. Often, still, this has been the, been the case for decades, the business IT rela relationship is often the weakest link with business and IT here at the marriage counselor. I'll be doing a session on this uh, t tomorrow at the same time, so if you're in interested in, um, in behavior, how that's driven by emotions and values, that you might be interested in that. So finally, the last point, adopting the right, um, the right attitude to um, uh, to DevOps. When I say kill DevOps, people start throwing rotten tomatoes at me because they think I'm anti I'm anti DevOps, but that's not the case. I intend it in a more Zen Buddhist way, drawing the analogy with the uh, with the monk on his road to awakening and enlightenment. And there's a there's a Buddhist saying, um, if you find Buddha on the road, kill him. The Buddha thinks he's found the truth, but you never find the truth. You never find Buddha. So you, the master hits him over the head with a, with a stick. Keep learning. Keep meditating, and that's the uh, that's the way it is in in Zen Buddhism. And I'd like to like to draw the analogy to the DevOps world to close up the talk, with an ancient DevOps proverb, two and a half thousand years old. If you meet DevOps on the road, kill it. Keep learning and experimenting, and th this is the third way of DevOps, because you will ne because it's such an emergent practice. Don't try and pin it down because that isn't really helpful. Realize that it's on the merge, adopt it in the way that suits you, whether it's in a narrow way or a more broad way, and try. But there's certainly in, in my 40 years in IT, this is the most fundamental movement I've I've come across. So I. Um, seriously recommend that you take a good look at it and try and get some, uh, some value out of that. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be lighted, delighted to continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.